674. 674. I have... Evening, Saints. Evening. Good to see everybody uh, this evening. Uh, glad that you're here. Glad to have the opportunity to meet midweek, uh, share con some concerns together, and uh, share uh, part of the Word of God. If you want to open up your bulletins, uh, we'll go over a few things together. I'm going to cut out the middleman this week, which the middleman's me. But I'm going to cut out the middleman. <laughs> Stuff's going to go straight into the computer. Uh, with, uh, with the bulletins the next couple weeks, I'm on a bit of a time crunch. So your stuff is going straight in. Uh, no putting it on paper and then uh, getting it over here. We're going straight to uh, the source. That's always a good idea to go straight to the source. So uh, <clears throat> you want to take a look uh, at the top there, look at the announcements. Um, as I mentioned, the Montana Family Camp is coming uh, right up here. So I encourage you that if you're planning on going that to go into that to go ahead and get registered. Uh, because of Montana Family Camp, there's no men's meeting um, this uh, in September. Our, our next men's meeting is October 6th. Uh, it starts at 9 a.m. Uh, it's generally the first uh, Lord's Day of every uh, month unless there's something like a camp or something that disrupts that schedule. Old Fashioned Family Camp is at Sugarloaf, September 6th and 7th. Um, the Men's Camp in Canfield, Ohio, really looking forward to uh, that. Um, that's September 19th through the 21st, and Pennsylvania Family Camp is October 11th through the 13th. Anything else that we should be uh, announcing? What's the first day of school? First day of school is September the 9th. September the 9th. So that's Monday, uh, September 9th, and then... Uh, I've talked to all of my staff, but just a reminder, we have a staff orientation meeting uh, on um, Saturday at 8 a.m. So, <clears throat> 8 a.m. Saturday staff orientation meeting. All right, um, Pennsylvania Family Camp uh, is our uh, mission of the month. We'll be having a presentation uh, of that. Um, I think that would be this coming uh, Sunday evening. So. Uh, keep the Bible studies in your prayers. Um, Sunday school teachers, thankful for the shotgun speakers. Uh, I think that was just last Thursday, wasn't it? I don't know, a lot's happened. Uh, <clears throat> thankful for Liza Cox uh, and her baby. Thankful that he's uh, healthy and continuing to recover. So continue to keep Liza and Jamie uh, and the baby uh, in your prayers. Good to see Arthur here and the family. What else do we have to be thankful for? Yeah. I'm not going to try naming anybody because I'll, I'll forget them. Yeah. Grateful and thankful for everybody who helped uh, come together for uh, Rosie's memorial and celebration of life there, and thankful for uh, the outreach of the saints and everybody working together for that. Thanks for the blessing of this building. What a good job everybody does in kind of picking up, and especially Bill Hawn showing things up. Yeah, I. I really appreciate the, as Mr. Harbour was saying, the, the building and the opportunities that we have to, to use it. Appreciate the stewardship of the building. Um, 
it is, um, you know, it takes stuff to maintain it, to, to keep her going, and uh, so that we can use it for the things that need to be used for. I appreciate everybody's uh, working together and teamwork and stewardship on that. What else do we have? Logan? Awesome. Praise God. So, Logan's job. Opportunities there. Denise? Have you talked to Courtney? I have not. Okay. We have an update. Um, on the 9th of August, uh, Jonah had the mask removed. Okay. They got it all. Um, they also removed four cancer slip notes, and they were able to save his kidney. Okay. Great. Uh, next step, he just came home the other day from the hospital yesterday. Um, and the next step is U of M at the end of next month. Okay, so they were able to remove uh, the cancerous mass um, from uh, Jonah Starkweather's, um, uh, the cancer there, and so uh, grateful and thankful for that. Continue to keep him in your prayers. They were able to save the kidney. Uh, so again, Jonah is uh, three years old and uh, his contact of uh, Dean and Denise's uh, Courtney uh, is in particular, and uh, I worked with Courtney at uh, Riley, and so there's a number of connections. I think Linnell's a relation cousin to her. Uh, so lots of connections there. Keep uh, Jonah, a three-year-old with cancer, thankful and grateful that the, uh, the surgery went well. Any other thank yous? Great. Awesome. So, <clears throat> Baby Cruz uh, is doing well. Anything else? Okay. So, on the prayer request side, uh, keep uh, church school in your prayers. Deb Apker, Russ and Hannah. Do they have travel plans yet? Um, like another, couple of weeks. another couple of weeks. Okay. Tom uh, and his foot, he's, he had an update for me, um, or for us. Uh, his ankle, a uh, pretty severe sprain, right? And then he broke uh, the toe on that foot as well. Uh, they're not going to have to do surgery. Uh, it's probably looking at another three or four weeks of recovery time. So continue to keep him uh, in your prayers. Um, Melody's, uh, Melody Frederick's dad, um, uh, Thibault, right? Larry Tabot. So keep uh, Larry Tabot uh, in your prayers. That's uh, Melody Frederick's dad. That's cancer. Yeah, I was able to go up and see uh, Melody and see him uh, the other night and uh, make the contact there. So. Okay. And he's not doing real well. Keep Larry in your prayers. Keep the Nicely family in your prayers. Um, Webb passed away, was it Friday or Saturday? Yeah, early Sunday morning. Early Sunday morning. Yeah. Um, and so they had his vis visitation on Tuesday, and then Mr. Harbor did his funeral on Wednesday. Uh, so continue to keep the Nicely family in your prayers. Keep, uh, of course, Dawn and her grief in your prayers and Kevin, but uh, also keep uh, Joey and Katie in your prayers. It was good a number of us got to make contact again with Joey and Katie. Uh, so, so keep them uh, and their families in your prayers. Mary Jo and her ear. Um, Dean, that's your sister Sharon, right? And she's going to be traveling, or she did travel? I, she talked about leaving tomorrow. Okay. So keep Sharon's travel in your prayers. It was good to see her on Sunday. Uh, Roby's grandma. Um, Brandon Merrill, is there any update there, Ryan? And then Brian Head, I um, think he's going to have a follow-up or appointment or surgery in a couple of weeks, so, so keep him in your prayers. What else should we add to this list? Nancy, Arthur? Nancy Chickford is all healed up. Okay. So travels um, to Montana. The Eastons are leaving tomorrow. Um, Nancy Chickering is good to go. So she's all healed. So you can add her to the thank you.
What else? Anything? All right, if there's not, let's sing uh, 851. 851, I'll fly away. Sing all three verses of this, and then uh, I'll have a time of prayer. Um, 851. So Great and glorious Heavenly Father, I'm grateful and thankful for the hope that we have in you. Father, I'm grateful and thankful that we will uh, discard this body, Lord God, and that we will uh, fly away. Lord, I'm so grateful and thankful for uh, the down payment uh, of our uh, resurrection body, Lord God, that we have your Holy Spirit living inside, that we are uh, sealed uh, with him uh, for the day of the redemption of our bodies, Lord God. I'm grateful and thankful for that. Father, I'm grateful and thankful for the body of Jesus Christ, for His church. Father, it's such a blessing to be able to be a part of the Lord's church, to be able to participate in uh, the purpose of the church. I'm grateful and thankful for the way that you have made up your body. Lord, I'm grateful and thankful for each and every member and the, the stewardship of the gospel uh, that we have. Father, I'm grateful and thankful for the stewardship of all of the many gifts that you have given to us, Lord God. As was mentioned this evening, the stewardship of, of the building and everybody who works uh, diligently to, to keep it looking nice so that we can have the outreach and the impact that we're really wanting to have. Father, I'm grateful and thankful for everybody's help and support with the... Um, with the the celebration of life for uh, Rosie, Lord God, and I just pray that you would continue to be with uh, the family there and that you would uh, be with those who are uh, grieving, Lord God. Father, I pray that you would be with the Nicely family and their loss as well, and I pray that you would be with uh, Joe and that you would be with Katie, Lord, and I just uh, pray that you would bless them, that we would have opportunities to continue to be your hands and your feet to them, Lord God, and to reach out and to be a part of their lives. Father, I'm grateful and thankful uh, for them thankful that uh, Nancy Chickering's all healed up and doing better and so super grateful for uh, Liza and that um, the baby Cruz is doing uh, well and I just pray that you continue to be with his uh, recovery, his development, Lord, is really what I'm talking about and I pray that you would uh, be with that development and that uh, he would grow and I'm just uh, so grateful for uh, the blessing of, of new life. Father, we know that you, uh, you really want... <clears throat> Uh, that you're really interested in the children, Lord God, and that you really uh, care about the kids and just so grateful and thankful for, um, for Cruz, Lord. Father, I do pray that you'd be with the rest of this assembly time. pray that you'd be with each and every uh, situation that's listed on the concern side of that. Lord, I pray that you would be with Glenn and that you would be with uh, Deb Apker, Lord God, and that you would help her to heal and that this would be an opportunity for Matt to continue to reach out to Glenn and continue to be your hands and your feet there, Lord God. Lord, I'm 
pray that you would be with uh, Sharon as she travels, Lord, and I pray that you would be with everybody who's uh, traveling out for Montana Family Camp. Pray that you would bless that camp, that we would go in with an attitude that we're being equipped, that we would go in with an attitude to encourage others, that we would go in with an attitude that we would be the ones uh, to reach out. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Uh, Data had surgery on her foot. Okay. So when was that? Uh, so so Data had surgery on her foot. Was that planned? Yeah. Yesterday morning. So keep Datha's uh, recovery in your prayers. You're going to be turning to song number 903. We'll do first and last, and then Ryan will come up. So keep Datha's surgery. She had surgery yesterday. Keep her recovery in your prayers. Nine hundred and three power in the blood. We're going to sing this uh, with some gusto. We'll sing first and last. Power in the blood. Nine zero three. Good evening, Saints. Good evening. All right. Uh, so, chapter 17 has been a great chapter, uh, and I'm really excited I got a, a part of it. So, um, Marshall assigned me 1 Samuel 17, 31 to 40. And let's go ahead and read that real quick. First Samuel seventeen thirty one to forty. Now when the words of David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let man let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he being a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant, used to keep his your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by, the, by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said to the Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And, he will, and, he, and Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling when he was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. Let's open up a word of prayer. 
Lord God in heaven, we are blessed and thankful to be here, to be able to open up your word, to be able to uh, reason and think through it, and to be excited about some of the things therein, to be encouraged and to have our faith enriched. Lord, just again, we pray that uh, your blessing tonight, pray that I can be able to speak clearly, and pray that uh, we can be attentive and be ready to listen and be ready to engage. Lord, just again, again, pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so one of the things that I really wanted to, I really appreciated some of the sentiments you had there Sunday evening, Mike. And one of the things that got me thinking whenever you mentioned about uh, sometimes when folks look at uh, Old Testament scriptures and they look at some of the, the, the great stories that are contained therein, you know, they, they, they look at them and they just look at them as great stories. And one of the things that kind of you maybe hear buzz, the buzzword, uh, I'm sure wherever Marshall is, uh, he probably knows, the archetypes, uh, as Jordan Peterson always references. But one of the things is an archetype is a, re you might hear that term, a lot of you might be familiar with it, but it's a reoccurring symbol or motif in literature and in art or mythology. And it's common, very consistent, uh, and it's really interesting when you start digesting a lot of um, great, or I should say some of the real famous literature or stories that we're all familiar with, um, you see this a, a, a lot of the archetypes. One of which is a really good, a good example of one of the archetypes is the coming of age of a, a ruddy youth, okay? So, like, a good example would be, like, say, Lord of the Rings, Frodo. He would be a coming of age, and he becomes hero. Another one is um, uh, the Star Wars stuff, uh, Luke Skywalker. And actually, jo George Lucas, when he was developing that, that, uh, the plays or the scripts, uh, their screenplays, uh, he was actually reading a guy named Joseph Campbell, who was um, a guy that was writing about um, archetypes and how they are in, ingrained in a lot of different literature and stories crossing cultural boundaries. Another one is uh, a really good one, much my kids liked, and maybe some, a lot of you guys maybe read it, but it's The Black Cauldron. If anybody's ever read that, those stories. But there's a, a guy named Lord Alexand Lloyd Alexander that wrote those stories, and really good books. Um, and I've got a chance to read them to, the, to my boys. Uh, but anyways, there's a, there's a young man in it, and his name's Torin. And that's, it's a coming-of-age story. Same elements. It's just, like, constant. But that archetype, that's a really good example of an archetype throughout culture. And there's something about that to be said, like, that one of the things the, 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 the psychologists who analyze, that have come up with these theories, one of the things they're finding is this consistent the themes throughout mankind, wherever it's crossing the cultural boundaries. And it's just really interesting because, and they look at obviously the story of David and the, the coming of age and him, you know, being this big hero. But one of the things it really points to is really the fact that God has hardwired our brains to want heroes. And that's really what this, that's what 17 is about, is like we get to see a hero. And that's what we need to be excited about. But if we just look at it as merely that, we really miss the bigger, bigger picture. Because the real hero is going to be coming a couple centuries later, or a couple millennium later. But it's, it, that's what the, and that's the part to be excited about. And if I don't, and I think that's what Mike's sentiment was, you know, if we just look at them as morality plays in the Old Testament, and we, and we don't really look at them at really pointing the way to Christ, then we really miss the point. Uh, and it really takes, it removes the strength of these, of these prophecies, it removes the strength of the Old Testament scriptures. And so that's what, that's ex this is just, it was just an exciting passage. Um, anyways, there's one, one scripture I did want to reference before we get into that. It's Revelation 19.10. It's all familiar with most of you guys, but one of the things that it's always, I remember reading, I think it was 11th hour times that Mr. Wilson did, and I remember that striking a chord, but Revelation 19.10, it just says that, and I, fell, and I fell at his feet, uh, John, to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am a fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the, and this is the last line I want to get to. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. At the core of all prophecy is this testimony of Christ. And that's, that's what, it's not just a mere morality play or a great story about some hero. It's really that the core of it is to, to point our way to Christ and everything about him. 
So it's just really, that's just, that's what's awesome about the Old Testament scriptures, and it's really hard not to go there with those, with those verses. Um, but anyways, um, so we'll dive into some of this stuff, and I kind of broke it down in, in this, um, and I, you know, Lord willing, I can be timely, I know, <laughs> I, know I don't want to be too long-winded, you, you guys will give me the hook. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, um, so I broke it down in a couple different spots. Uh, really, the first piece is David's words that get that get that go to Saul, and then the next piece I got into was um, is really David's credentials as deliverer. Okay, because that's really kind of you got to really question those um, or should. Uh, and then the, the last piece is David's armor. Uh, so the really the when you start looking at David's words here, you know, really verses 31 and 32, you, you know, um, our words have a, a way of making their way uh, or putting us in certain predicaments, uh, whether we like it or we don't, um, you know, uh, but they have a way of caring or uh, being made known. In this case here, you know, uh, the ruddy youth here makes his statement and you know, he's asking some questions. And, and let's look back at 26 at some of the questions, or I should say some of the statements he made that came to Saul's ear. Um, and he really asked two questions. So in, in 26 there it says, David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered, and him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Okay, so really there's two questions that get asked by David that make their way to King Saul's ear. And it's really interesting. Uh, uh, I, Matt and I, Matt Towers, obviously, and I get to talk, chat at work occasionally. And one of the things they've been telling me about is this, uh, this whiz transmission guy in... Uh, uh, wherever he's fed, <laughs> but he's, this guy's just this whiz with transmissions. I've had transmission troubles with my car, so I've been seeking advice in different areas. So anyways, uh, one of the things that was interesting, though, is Matt was describing to me how uh, he was diagnosing a problem of Jalen, his son's car problems, and it was over the phone, and he was asking questions, and the guy knew exactly how to answer the He asked like a... Like, 15 questions to diagnose the problem. So, in a lot of ways, if you aren't really, you won't ask questions if you aren't looking for solutions. See, that guy was, obviously, he's trying to solve the transmission problem, so he's asking a lot of questions in order to, to get to the solution. So, David's solution-oriented. He's, he's asking the questions to figure out how to get, we, we want answers. So, that's really more important. Sometimes it's not really the able to answer. It, it's, it's just as important to be asking questions as it is to be answering them. Do so, you know what I mean? Because otherwise we're not really solution-oriented. And so that's what, David's a solution-oriented guy. He's wanting to get to the answer here. And that's what he points out. He says, well, what should be done with this guy? You know, that, uh, that uh, or I should say, uh, that, uh, back it up here, don't want to miss it. <laughs> um, what's going to be done to the guy who kills this Philistine? And then the next point is, um, you know, uh, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies? So the question is, what's going to be done for this guy? What's his reward? And then the other question is, who does this guy think he is? He's, and he points out he's an, unright, he's an uncircumcised Philistine. So, there's, so he's asking the questions. And it, by asking the questions, he's basically throwing his hat in the ring and saying, I'm looking for the solution. I can be the solution. So a lot of times that's what happens is we don't want to ask the questions because we don't necessarily want to be the solution. So, um, and, I, and when I speak, sometimes I'm speaking it myself. <laughs> so it's not necessarily directed at any person, <laughs> uh, but, but me. Um, so anyways, and it, again, it really takes courage to be asking the questions that David's asking. Um, so, 
And obviously they, get the, they make their way to the king. It says, now when the, king, now when the words which David spoke were heard, they were reported to Saul, and he sent for him. Okay. Probably not realizing what he was getting when he sent for him, but hey, who's this, somebody's actually courageous enough to maybe do this? <laughs> so he, he sends for him, and, you know, maybe a little bit, maybe in shock when, when Saul sees him, um, but the first thing that comes out of David's mouth to King Saul is very interesting. You know, and that's really, I, he asks, <laughs> he says, uh, let not your heart fail, your servant will go and fight this, uh, used to say, then said to David, let man's heart fail, let, let no man's heart fail because of him, your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Okay. The ruddy youth is comforting the king of Israel. Is really what's going on. Let not your heart, heart fail you. Okay, so David is comforting King Saul. And it really reminds me of like, there's so much irony sometimes in scripture. Okay, and this is one of the, one of the spots. Okay, you have, this, you have this shepherd boy comforting the king of Israel. Okay, and then you have the apostle Paul, prisoner, comforting those outside the prison. And, I mean, we're all familiar. We're, it's usually the other way around. We're always, we're always comforting the prisoner. But in that case, it was the prisoner. There's just some irony there. Another, one's an ir- another piece of irony is, um, is uh, John, John 14. Turn there real quick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's what's like, man, this... <laughs> Turn to John 14. I get, I got to get better, Dennis, because I start doing this, and I'm like, where's my, where's my notes? It's my tether. <laughs> Dennis has told me, just, you got it. Just, just don't, you don't even need those notes. <laughs> uh, so I got to make the leap, see. Next, next step. That's good. All right, so uh, uh, John 14. Um, I just want to read a couple verses there into it, into six, starting at one. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again upon rece- and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And now, and where I go, you, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, you know, these guys are all downtrodden and, you know, worried and bothered. And the guy that's on death row is the guy that's encouraging them and comforting them and saying, let not your heart be troubled. How how's that usually work in the physical world? And in the in, the, in the, it's usually the other way around. It's you're comforting them. The person that's on death row. It's not normal, but that's the kind of person that Jesus is. I mean, he, um, you know, obviously just tremendous encouragement. But it's there's so much irony in Scripture like that. It's like because it's showing that it's beyond it's it's beyond. Um, it's beyond the physical. It's the, it's the spiritual power that works within the individual. So let's just turn back to our first Samuel passage now. Um, so the next thing that's interesting, at least I thought was interesting, is okay. That's that was David's words uh, making their way to the king of Israel. I mean, being being known. The next piece is David's David's credential as deliverer, um, because. And, you know, Saul's got his doubts, and he should. I mean, if you saw a, a, the, the shepherd boy come in front of you, then you, you should be questioning it. You should be like, you're the guy that said this. You're the guy that they're reporting to me about. Okay, so, it, it, and that's really what, because Saul's statement backed him. He says, and Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. 
Now the question that should come to our minds is, what does he mean by youth? Because this is a while, you know, it's like, you know, talk about Timothy and his, let no one despise your youth. Okay, well, what's that mean? Like, there's all these different, like, what, and I don't want to get up here and say that this is, I, I'm going to know David's exact age when he's in front of King Saul, because I'm not, it's, it's not in the scripture. But I do maybe have a theory or a thought that may be a rough approximation of his age. And it actually made me, th when I was looking at some of this stuff, it made me think and answer some other questions I had, or at least it might be a possible answers. But um, does everybody, and some of you probably recall this, but um, how old does a person have to be to be in the Lord's army? Numbers 1-3, one tw one right? 21 was the yeah, tw 20 is what I, uh, numbers 1, 3 is what I was seeing. Uh, but yeah, you, uh, so let's look at that. Numbers 1, 3. Turn there real quick. Um, I think it's 1. Hopefully I wrote it down the right reference. <laughs> yeah, it just says, take, uh, it says, in verses 2, it says, Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel, by their families, by their father's house, according to the number of the names, every male individually, for 20 years and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel. You and Aaron shall number them and their armies. So, tw plus 20, you know, basically 20 and over. Um, so, that should tell us that, okay, remember, where's David when, as, we, as pointed out already in review, David was not at the battle. His older brothers were. Uh, his three older brothers, they were there. But he was not. He was, his father sent him to go report and hear back what's going on with the war, you know, the war effort here. And take all these gifts to, the, uh, to your brothers and to the, their captains. So that's where David's not in battle. So he's, there's pretty good reason to think that he's under 20. Okay. Now, the other thing that, to think about is, um, is David has, uh, if you guys remember, turn back to 1 Kings 16. How many sons does Jesse have? Sixteen. And that's actually uh, verses 7 to 10 there. It says, says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. The Lord does not see as the man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither him or neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Sh uh, Shammai pass by, and, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. So then he's going to pick, then he's going to call and says, Well, I do have one more son. He's a little fellow. He's out in the field. Bring him in. Okay, so he's got seven older brothers, and, how, and three are in the battle or at, at the war front. So that means there's you know, four other brothers in between there that are not in, in, in battle. So the, the thought is that maybe they were also under 20, and if all the boys were about a year apart, as they are in some households, <laughs> uh, if they're all about a year apart, uh, then they, he's, there's, it's a very good chance that David's like 14 or 15 years old. It, it's just the thought. I mean, I'm not saying that we know exact age, but when you start to put that in perspective, it's sort of like you know, if we had Isaac standing up here. My son Isaac, he's, he's 15, or, or Nick. I mean, Nick's 14, right? Yeah, so Nick or Isaac coming up here, and, they, and they're confronting the king, King Saul. So it's, it, it, no wonder David, or so no wonder Saul is questioning David a little bit, like, you're the guy that's going to do this? I, I don't know about that. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if I'm willing to quite go there and trust a young kid like this. So... But uh, desperate measures calls for, des you know, I should say desperate situations call for desperate measures, I guess. And, and that's what really is kind of what sways it. But so he's, he's questioning David, questioning his uh, credentials as a youth uh, to be able to do this task. 
And, you know, obviously, the other part to that is, uh, you know, they always talk about it in athletics. Uh, they talk about, you know, the rookie guy going up against the more experienced guy. And that's really what's going on here because he's saying, because he says that Goliath here is a, is a man of war, a man of war from his youth. And I've read stuff and heard stuff about Goliath and, you know, you know maybe he wasn't the, the warrior that, that it's made out to be and that, uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, growth syndrome, uh, androf androphobia, like, like Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant has this, the, the same, had the condition and died from it. Um, you guys, everybody remembers Andre the Giant, the wrestler, right? Okay, Princess Bride, you know. <laughs> but that guy in that movie, by the way, he couldn't even hold up his arms. Like his arms were like shot. Like that, uh, and I wanna, I'm, I'm use, losing the term, but it's like andromorphy, and it's where they, their pituitary gland, gland, gland releases too much uh, growth hormone, and they, they just, their body stretches out, their joints wear out. It's, it's not good for them. But anyways, um, you know, I've heard some reports that that's what he, that, that Goliath was that. He was, suffered from pituitary gland. He was really just a figurehead, not really a good warrior. That's not what the scripture paints. It says he's a man of war, and I'm like, I don't think, he, I think he's, I think he's battle hardened. I think he's tough. I don't think he's a wimp. So, but, you know, but it's interesting because it, so, again, this man of war, you know, it's going to be no match for this this young this young pup, this young shepherd boy. But there's something working in that shepherd boy's favor. So, um, so the other thing that's interesting is. Um, David's response then back to him to, to basically show King Saul, hey, you know what, you know, you can put your, you know, let me, let me tell you a little bit about my experience. I guess in a sense he's probably given him his interview, you know, his professional credentials, but <laughs> what, what little bit he has as a youngster, he's given his credentials here um, to David. Um, and what's interesting about it is, how he, he, he uses examples of, you know, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. Okay, and then there, was, there were times when those sheep were taken by lions or bears. Okay, and when a lion or bear came and took him, I personally went out and retrieved said lamb. So, Number one, that takes, well, that takes some courage. I mean, I've seen lions in zoos, and I've seen, like, stuffed bears. I've never actually, uh, you know, seen one up close or, or, you know, or lions up close, but I've seen them. And, I mean, they're pretty big. And to throw one of those off or to, to rescue a lamb from those would be, uh, would be pretty tough. Um, it would be pretty, you know, that takes some courage and some guts. Um, so, but what, it, what it's really interesting, and I never really picked up on this until I was reading through this. I never really saw this, and, and some of you guys probably already, might have already seen it. But what's interesting about when he describes his credentials or his, um, his courage to King Saul, he says, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb. He left his the rest of his flock in order to go get the one that was in the clutches of the lion or the bear. I wonder who that might sound like. Again, not a morality play. We're pointing the way to somebody else. And that's really what this is about. Um, so anyways, he, and, and, I, and I guess uh, that particular thing got me stewing or thinking about different things. And I was like, man, how many times do we see that in the life of Christ when he was doing that exact same thing? I mean, it, it's, and I always appreciate there was a message at the New York family camp that Jay Wilson did, and it was, and, I, and maybe he's done it other places, but it was one. That was his message, the value of one person. And like David here is showing tremendous He's putting tremendous value on the one lamb that was his father's that had gotten away by a predator. 
And Jesus is the exact same way. I want to made me think about um, for time's sake. I won't go. I won't go through all these. But there's two really good examples of them. I mean, there's like a couple of them actually in the Gospels. One of them in particular is the woman at the well. He confronts her, and hey, look, that lady's got that, that lady's got baggage. She's got uh, challenges in her life, and Jesus specifically goes one on one and talks to her. Um, but one that I thought was really interesting, if you, I, I really appreciate it, is John chapter uh, 9. And I won't read all of this, but you know, this is the one where it starts out with Jesus healing the blind man, and you know, the guys are kind of trying to figure out, well, who's, whose sin did he commit, his sin or his parents, da da da. You know, Jesus says, neither which. This is all about the glory of God, okay? <laughs> don't, don't get hung up with whatever physical ailment is out there on a particular person. Realize that if they're overcome, it's because of the glory of God. All right, so John chapter 9, verse 35 to 41. And, and this is after actually, um, you know, this blind guy that's now been healed has to give some testimony in front of some religious leaders. And, and the results are that he's cast out. And so that's, he's cast out of the synagogue. So that's where verse 35 picks up. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered, and he said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to him, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. But Jesus, when he heard this guy got cast out. Remember, Jesus got three and a half years. I mean, Marshall mentioned about efficiency with time. You know, making, making the most of it. Jesus got three and a half years, okay, and then he's going to be, he's going to be uh, crucified. So he's got limited time to do his... But he makes time in his schedule to go to this guy who got cast out of the synagogue. That, that's... And it's... Again, he's working that same program. The type is there in David that he left his, the rest of the flock in order to go salvage or save one of his father's sheep or lamb from the clutches of the predator... You think there's a predator that's lurking right here for this guy, this blind guy? Jesus is making a special point because that guy has value. By the way, that guy, if you read the whole account in 9, he's got some real moxie. I mean, he's got some toughness because they keep bugging him. Like, do you wish to be his disciple also? You know, like he's kind of back and forth with them a little bit, the religious leaders, Pharisees. So go, I encourage you to go back and read the rest of 9. But this just goes to show you where... The, the kind of person Jesus is and how David is such a type of that of, of Jesus. Um, the other one that's pretty famous or pretty familiar with everybody is Matthew uh, 18, 12 makes reference, uh, or at least Jesus is speaking of it. Uh, so turn to Matthew 18, 12. Obviously using a parable, a parable of himself and then anybody that would follow after him. He says, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that heaven, they're, they're in heaven and angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to seek or to save that which is lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, one of them goes astray, does he, not, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek that one that is straying? And if he should find it, surely I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of his, your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Again, he's put in, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. Don't, make, don't, make, don't miss the value of just each person, no matter how uh, inconsequential they may appear. They have value. And that's what, that's what Jesus is saying. This was Jesus' MO. Leave the 99 in order to save that the one, the one that was lost, the one that has value. So, and, and again, again, he talks about the rejoicing of having found that one. Um, 
just as, even more so than the 99 he's got. So pretty, pretty exciting stuff, but I never picked up on how David is really a type of, how, of Christ and really what Christ lived in his life and, and continues to live through us. Um, all right, so let's uh, uh, go back to, to 1 Samuel there. Um, See if I, uh, all right, I got through that. Okay. Um, all right, the next thing that's interesting is about his credentials, or gives, I guess, the next thing is that David has confidence when he, when he gives his credentials, is, and this is sort of like where it's a little tricky, it's like, um, I always feel weird when I'm in interviews because it's like I have to like stump for myself a little bit. You have to kind of, but it's like it's kind of the last thing you want to do is like, okay, is 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 pub for yourself. You know, like sports heroes, they're really good at, at pubbing for themselves, <laughs> unfortunately. And uh, you know, you, you, it's very, it's I should say, it's uh, you're looking for the team guys, not necessarily the the guy that's a, an eye guy. So, but anyways. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that David mentions in this, though, is about delivering these lambs and these uh, from from the bear or the lion. He says, he says, and this uh, he says, I caught it. Uh, okay, yeah. In verse thirty-six, says, your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the Paul of the lion and from the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord will be with you. So, in that, he's, yes, he did go out and seek these, these lambs from these predators, but more importantly, he mentions that it's God that actually delivered him from these situations. He's not, he's not I didn't do it. It was God that had delivered me from this trial. And why would it be any different, him delivering me from this same trial? It's, it, you know, different, uh, same, I should say, it's a trial nonetheless, but it, the Lord delivered me from these others, so why wouldn't he deliver me from this? And that's constantly uh, got to remind ourselves of that same point, is like, well, if God delivered me from this situation, well, why wouldn't he deliver, God, provide, you know, God provided an answer here in this area, well, why wouldn't he provide another one? So, and that's, nobody ever, I don't think anybody here probably ever has thought that before. Like, I mean, I, I, mean, I, mean, no, I don't think, I, I, maybe I'm the only one that's ever thought that. <laughs> but, you know, ever, all of us are in that situation. We, we need to be reminded of it, that God's going to, God, if he answered these prayers or provided wisdom in this situation, he's going to do it again. We just got to keep believing it. So, all right. So... Um, <clears throat> so that's the other thing that's, that's, that gives David confidence and gives him the ability to be able to do this, to be able to stand against Goliath. And the next thing that's really interesting is you, know, you, got, you got the armor part. And um, you, know, you have uh, Saul, clothes himself, Saul clothed David with his armor. Okay, so king of Israel gives his armor to, uh, to David. And, um, you know, obviously, I believe Tom mentioned about some of the weights and things of some of that armor and how heavy they would have been and how... And, and now, that was Goliath's armor, which bigger guy, you know, big, you know, heavier armor. But I'm sure Saul was the one that stood head and shoulders above the, the rest of the Israelites. I'm sure his, his armor was not light either. Hence the reason why David's like, I, you know, doesn't want to wear it, but but anyways, <clears throat> so he puts on the arm, he puts on the bronze head, bronze helmet, he puts on the coat of mail. You know, everybody, I think everybody here is familiar with mail. It's that chain link stuff. You know, the the undergarments that the under that, that protect uh, the innards. Um, so you know, and he gives him that, and he gives him uh, he gives him a sword, um, uh, and he tries to walk, which is interesting. So I don't. I'm, I don't know. I'm just guessing. I, I, I'm like picturing the male, like runs close to the bottoms of his feet, so he's like kind of, yeah, 
I mean, that might not be what it's like, but that's sort of what I picture, is David sort of like, you know, kind of waddling to try to get, get moving. And, you know, carrying his, his, his sword, I mean, he's not, I mean, <laughs> if I'm going to fight, I better be able to move. <laughs> that's basically what it comes down to. Um, so David's like, forget this. I, I'm, I'm going to be useless in battle if I can't even move. So he discards that and, you know, quickly uh, moves on to the, the, what's really going to be. Um, but ultimately, the armor that David really needed, he's already got. He's already got faith, which is really the armor that he, re- that he needed anyways. He didn't need, he didn't need Saul's stuff. He's already armored. Before he meets Saul, he's already armored. That's the same way with us. If we have faith, we're already armored. We don't need to, we don't need to put on any extra. We don't need to do anything, any extraneous thing. We just need to have faith. So, <coughs> which reminds me of really what armor is David wearing? It's, it's by faith. Turn to Romans 13. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. <laughs> Romans, I'm sorry, did I say 15? I meant 13. I was looking at 15. It said, Romans 13. In verse 11, And do this, knowing that the time, that now is high time to wake out of sleep, for now, now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The, might, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness and lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision, no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. See, it's the first thing is, the closer that David got to that field of battle, the closer he was to victory. The closer we get, each day passes, the closer we are to victory. And that's what he, he's saying, let us put on the armor of light. The day's far spent, let's put on the armor of light. It's the only thing that's going to protect us. And in order to do that, we've got to put some things away. I have to put some things away. Um, uh, yeah. All right. Okay, I'm doing pretty good. All right. So, so he puts on the armor. Of, uh, he, he charges in, uh, you know, I should say he discards. Turn back to 1 Samuel now. He uh, discards the, uh, Saul's armor, and he gets on what he really needs. Um, and that's where it comes um, in verse 40 there. And he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch, which he had, and he sling in his hand, and drew near to the Philistine. Okay, so there's a lot of things to be said right here about this, the, the actual humble weapon that he does carry into battle. Um, <clears throat> shepherd's staff is the first thing. He picks up his staff. Okay, now that's probably a, a wooden stick. It's not going to be very good against bronze. Probably not going to stand if you were to get into a duel. <clears throat> the other thing is he's picking up a shepherd's sling. Okay, the, so shepherd's sling, like everybody I think has seen probably pictures of them, but they're like, what I was looking at online was they're like basically two little leather strings with like a little, uh, tend to be like a small soft pouch. And um, they're not much to them. So it's a pretty humble weapon. But... If you, actually it's kind of interesting when you start looking at uh, like these types of slings. Uh, one of the articles I was looking at, they were talking about um, that they are extremely, they can be extremely accurate. And that's actually what David really needed. He needed to be, he needed to be, he had pinpoint accuracy. However, uh, what I was looking at online is in order to be accurate, you really have to practice like a lot. Like you have to get, you have to, um, Practice a lot. Hence, if you're out guarding sheep, probably a good, probably a good opportunity to practice. <laughs> and it really, you know, sharpened his senses or sharpened his ability to be accurate with the slinging of the stones. And um, 
I remember when I was, when I was, a, when I was a junior high as a kid, um, you guys all know my dad, or a lot of you know my dad, but <laughs> in baseball, he said, best thing you can do to, get, to be a better hitter is just go out there, take a broom handle, and bat rocks. Well, and it was. It was actually excellent because you had to actually, and I did it repetitively, but it really helped a lot because the, the broomstick was so tiny, and then the rocks were like, you know, the pebbles. So you had to really practice your accuracy. But it was a constant thing. And I kind of picture David doing the same thing. as this constant, constantly practice. I wonder if I could hit that <laughs> in the, when he's out there guarding sheep. I wonder if I could hit that up there. <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, got to pass the time with something. So it was practicing. But really, a lot of times that's what, you know, we're practicing. Like right now, this is a practice, preparing, mentally, mentally reasoning, thinking through scriptures, practicing, practicing on ourselves. You know, it was really about, that's what this is about, getting up here and speaking. I really appreciate being able to do it, because it does, it practices. You have to think about things, you have to ask questions, you have to look at the scripture closely. So he's practicing, he's, all the time he's practicing. And like I said, if he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been able to hit that guy square in the head. I mean, he's not going to be able to knock Goliath out if he hadn't been practicing. Um, like I said, this, what I was seeing online was some of those slings... They said they're, they could be as accurate up to, like, basically 50 yards. They could hit something within 50 yards. So it's pretty, pretty good. And then the other thing he talks about in picking up five small, smooth, five stones. And, you know, obviously if you have been slinging, uh, practicing with your, your, uh, your sling, you're going to know what stones to pick. And he picked them out of the stream because those are ones that usually tend to be smooth and they probably have a good density. Probably like uh, similar to a ball bearing, you know, when you're, you're shot. And, I mean, you know, basically it's like a, it's like a, yeah, it's like a ballistic. It's like a, it's a metal ball that's coming, or close enough to a metal ball being slung at Goliath's head. So, I mean, it's perfect weapon. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure he's like, when we're going to, I'm not sure who has the next section, but, I mean... Like I said, they're kind of, you know, Goliath's going to kind of laugh this guy off because he says, what are you coming to me with, with sticks? I mean, this little guy here, what, what's going on? So, but nonetheless, he's, he's very good at, at slinging the stone, and that's, and that, but ultimately, whether, you know, David's, pra all that stuff is just preparatory, really, to the fact that the Lord's, you know, the practicing of the, of the stone, the, the slinging the stones, the, uh, the courage that it took to be, uh, to deliver his father's sheep from the, from, the, from the predator. Any of that stuff is just preparatory. And really, ultimately, it's just David stepping into the spotlight. Or I should say, David stepping in faith and realizing that the Lord's victory is, it's the Lord's victory and not his. And um, so I'll close on that. I think there's a lot of, I think that's about, about right. So, um, I uh, appreciate, again, being able to go through it. Sec First Samuel's been a really good book. I uh, really appreciate some of you other guys' lessons. I've learned a lot from just doing it. So, All right, so you want me to just close in prayer? Yeah, okay. Okay, let's, let's pray. Lord God in heaven, again, we're so thankful and, and blessed uh, to um, have the example of Jesus Christ to go before us, to be able to follow in his footsteps, to be able to be part of his kingdom, to be able to emulate him as a... Uh, um, uh, a child emulates his father. And Lord, we're just again thankful for all the preparation that, um, our preparatory uh, situations that you put us in, knowing that each, each, each little test that comes our way, each little difficult situation comes our way, it's, it strengthens our faith to be able to trust in you, to be able to, be, to understand that you are indeed the deliverer. And that ultimately all of these little tests just add up to be, be able to conquer the, the big test, and that is to be able to overcome death. Lord, we're just so thankful and appreciative of those, uh, the things written in the Scripture because they are encouraging, they build our faith. And Lord, again, we just again, are appreciative of the fact that um, you lead the way, being the captain of our salvation. Lord, again, we just pray uh, as we part ways this, uh, tonight, we just pray, Lord, that we can finish the week out and be able to, be, um, be able to meet again at the next appointed time. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.